So here's the situation. We're looking for a way to test the predictive power of quantum mechanics a step beyond simply predicting the spectrum of hydrogen. More specifically, we want to see what quantum mechanics has to say about time-dependent potentials, whereas the usual hydrogen atom is just solving it for a time-independent potential. The basic formalism of time-dependent quantum mechanical perturbation theory is known to us, but it's our job to complete the theoretical process and extract an actual numerical prediction that we can compare to experiment and through that make a test of quantum mechanics like we set out to do. To start with, we decide to stick with experimenting on hydrogen because that helps keep the mathematics needed for the theoretical prediction tractable. Of course, we don't know exactly what will be tractable before we try it, but sticking with hydrogen certainly makes its tractability more likely. We therefore seek to come up with a both theoretically predictable and experimentally measurable time-dependent process that hydrogen can undergo. Our hypothetical experimentalist partner tells us that it's relatively easy to dump a lot of charge onto two parallel plates very fast, of course two parallel plates between which we can hold hydrogen atoms, and then conduct that charge way more slowly through resistors. The benefit of this situation is that to good approximation it gives us the option of working with this mathematically convenient electric field and associated potential, which of course is partly this simple because of a convenient gauge choice. Now let's look at this for a moment. We have no electric field and then suddenly it turns on to a finite value at t equals zero and then decays exponentially. The sudden increase at t equals zero matches our idea of dumping charge onto two parallel plates very fast, and then the exponential decay after t equals zero corresponds to this slower dissipation through resistors. And of course, exponentials are easy to work with mathematically, and the potential only needs to depend on a single variable, so that's the mathematical convenience. And beyond this, we can even request that the electric field be kept relatively small so that we can stick to first-order time-dependent perturbation theory relatively accurately. Perhaps later on we might try more advanced calculations which don't require the electric field to be small if our first predictions turn out to be accurate in the regime of parameters where they're supposed to be and we want to test quantum mechanics even further. That's often how physics proceeds. And with that we have our theory test. We can shock hydrogen with a weak version of the above electric field and see what that does to the state of the hydrogen atom. Since we're keeping the field relatively weak, one would expect at most a transition to the first excited state to be very likely, so as a theorist part of this theory testing process, we must use first order quantum mechanical time dependent perturbation theory to calculate the transition probabilities to the first three excited states. And then we can hand that over to our experimentalist to see how accurate our theory is. All of these specifics might seem like a disappointing loss of generality, might seem a bit contrived, but this actually isn't as crazy of a homework problem as you might think. Individual experiment theory comparisons in physics are often like this. A lot of specific selections often need to be made to ensure that the problem is tractable on both the experimental and the theoretical side at the same time, especially when you're in the early stages of testing a theory. A byproduct of this, of course, is that it's often a very slow process to accumulate enough different comparisons to convincingly back a whole theory. However, regardless of that, the important thing is that we do actually now have what we need to start actually doing the theoretical calculation. As I noted right here, quantum mechanical time-dependent first-order perturbation theory gives us this expression for the transition probability from one state to another, and it's therefore this integral in the matrix element inside it, or more specifically the limit as capital T goes to infinity of it, that we need to evaluate to get the information that we need. We can then take the modulus squared of the resulting amplitude to get the actual probability, which is something we can compare to experiment. The easiest way to actually evaluate this is to start by just straight up doing the time integral, ignoring the time independent matrix element inside here, because thankfully the potential we're dealing with is actually separable. From there we can take the limit as t goes to infinity, which leaves us with a relatively simple result. It's the probability that we're interested in, and that makes it useful to evaluate the absolute square for the general case before we even bother to evaluate these matrix elements 
that completely finishes up handling the time part and reduces the problem purely to evaluating this set of four matrix elements. Fortunately, we can get through that surprisingly quickly by applying the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. As you'll see, that'll reduce the problem from four integrals to just one. Applying the Wigner-Eckhart theorem, though, requires us to rewrite the operator in this matrix element in terms of spherical tensors. Fortunately, that process is really easy because this specific spherical harmonic is almost proportional to z right away, so no complicated algebraic manipulations are required. And with this result, we're ready to move immediately on to the application of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem. This, as you may remember, is the famous Wigner-Eckhart theorem. Given which Klebsch-Gordon coefficients turn out to be zero, we have these selection rules immediately, which, if applied to our case, take this form. We can see from considering these specific selection rules that these three of the four matrix elements that we're interested in are immediately zero. So that's how the Wigner-Eckhart theorem saves us a whole bunch of time here. But, of course, we still do have one matrix element that isn't zero, and we are going to have to do an integral to evaluate that one. And, of course, that's the 100211 matrix element of Z. Remembering our wave functions, we can plug that in immediately and start working down the integral. It turns out to be relatively trivial compared to what some integrals in physics turn out to be, and we get this elegant result for it. Plugging that into the absolute square gets us this strange factor, and with this result and those zero values we got above, and the time integral we already did, and the limit we did after that, we now have everything we need to put our results together. These are the absolute squares that we need, which leaves us with this set of probabilities. We see that at least among the first excited states, there's only one that we have a chance of transitioning to, to first order and perturbation theory, and that is 2, 1, 0. And given the Wigner-Eckhart theorem, we have no possibility, at least to first order, to see these kinds of transitions. And with that, we've got the predictions that we needed. We can hand these over to our hypothetical experimentalist partner, and they can put them to the test. Hopefully this proved to be an interesting exercise in using the Wigner-Eckhart theorem and in doing first-order time-dependent quantum mechanical perturbation theory. Thanks for watching.